Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our ECHO session today and our last session of the Pediatric Clinical Competencies. My name is Georgia Castillo, and I'm in my last semester of my entry-level doctoral program, and I am researching the effectiveness of this virtual program to increase your confidence and your knowledge on various topics. Today, there will be a 30-minute presentation and a real case study for discussion. You will learn from one another and will have your knowledge re-examined through a local lens. Through shared support, guidance, and feedback, this will lead to a collective understanding of how to implement the best occupational therapy practices across diverse settings. This program is free and available due to your participation in this research study. Therefore, it is highly encouraged that you complete any survey links you receive before and after the session. You will not receive a certificate of attendance unless you complete the pre and post surveys sent to your email. If you have any questions, I will go ahead and put my email in the chat. And I would now like to introduce myself because I will be presenting today. Let me get it set up. Perfect. Okay, so as I stated earlier, my name is Jahidra Castillo, and I will be presenting today on Play for Children with Autism. I am currently at MGH Institute of Health Professions at my last se semester here in Boston um, in the entry-level doctoral program. And kind of some background information, I just participated in six months of clinical work, and 12 of those weeks were done at an outpatient pediatric center in California, where I was introduced to a lot of children with a lot of diagnoses, but a large population were children with autism. And along with that were a lot of children with sensory processing difficulties. Um, and personally, it wasn't something that I had too much knowledge based on. So I had to kind of take a step back and do a lot of research on sensory behaviors as well as regulation strategies, uh, where I was luckily able to learn a lot and even learn a bit, a bit about myself and my own sensory behaviors. So we'll go ahead and get started. If at any point you have any questions, please send it in the chat or Kate can unmute herself and let me know. All right, so the content is, we'll first start with some learning objectives. We will then go into the definitions and then regulation strategies for occupations, specifically looking at play as an occupation. And then we will do a sample home program that you can provide to your patients or that you can use yourself with your clients. And then we'll go into the case study. Okay, so the first learning objective is to determine an appropriate assessment, standardized or observation-based, Describe sensory behaviors, including the organization of the behaviors, and identifying various sensory regulation strategies to promote play for an autistic child. And so to kind of just give a definition of autism spectrum disorder so that we're all on the same page, it is a neurological and developmental disorder that affects how people interact, communicate, learn, and behave. Early signs of this disorder can be noticed by parents and caregivers or pediatricians before a child reaches one year of age. However, symptoms typically become more consistently visible by the time a child is two or three years old. In some cases, the problems related to autism may be mild and not apparent until the child starts school, after which their def deficits may be pronounced um, once they're compared amongst their peers. A parent, caregiver, or teacher can then voice their concerns about their child's behavior, and this will then lead to a special, specialized evaluation by a developmental pediatrician, a pediatric psychologist, a child neurologist, and or a child um, adolescent psychiatrist. And so as we know, as occupational therapists, we are unable to diagnose the child with autism, but we are still allowed to treat, and we can definitely assess some um, qualities that the child may have. And so this evaluation done by the pediatrician um, involves interviewing the parent and the caregiver, 
um, observing and interacting with the child in a structured manner, and sometimes conducting additional tests to rule out any other disorder. And so some further symptoms include restricted interest and repetitive behaviors, and then symptoms that affect their ability to function in school, work, and other areas of life, such as play. So what is sensory processing? The, the term sensory integration and processing refers to client factors that support the ability to use what we sense to make meaning of the world and our place in it. These, facts, these factors have the potential to support or impede participation and function across occupations and environments. Sensory processing or integration is also known as being able to effectively use effective registration and an accurate interpretation of sensory input in the environment, including your own body. It is the way the brain receives, organizes, and responds to sensory input um, in order to behave in a meaningful and consistent manner. And so we'll go ahead and go to kind of describe senses. So we first have the visual sense which is the ability to understand and interpret what is seen. And this allows the visual system to receive information about contrast of light and dark, color and movement. And then you have the auditory sense, which is the ability to interpret information that is heard from the, from the outer and middle ear. And you receive noise and sound information about volume, pitch and rhythm. The gustatory sense is the ability to interpret information regarding taste in the mouth, and it uses the tongue to receive taste sensations to detect if they are safe and harmful. The olfactory sense is the ability to interpret smells using the nose to receive information from the chemical makeup in the air. And then you have the tactile sense, which is the ability to interpret information coming into the body by the skin, and this can understand understand touch sensations like as such as pressure, vibration, movement, temperature, and pain. And then you also have two other senses known as the proprioceptive sense and the vestibular sense. The proprioceptive sense is the ability to interpret where your body parts are in relation to each other. And the vestibular sense is the ability to interpret information relating to movement and balance. The ear will receive information about how fast or slow we are moving, balance and movement from the neck, eyes, and body, and overall body position and orientation in space. And so what is the prevalence of sensory processing for children? Um, this study, one study showed that sensory processing affects 5 to 15% of school-aged children. And a new result from USC-led study revealed that 3% of all children have elevated sensory traits that seemingly worsen as they grow from infants and toddlers into school-age children. And finally, one in six children have sensory processing difficulties. And even in some specific populations, the prevalence can be as high as 80 to 100%. So sensory processing difficulties are very relevant with the population of pediatrics. And so here we have this chart made by Winnie Dunn, and this kind of separates all our sensory processing um, in two different ways. And so on the top, we have hyposensitivity or having a high neurological threshold, which is abnormally decreased sensitivity to sensory input. On the opposite end, we have hypersensitivity, which is heightened awareness, and it's typically associated with avoided behavior or provocative stimuli, of provocative stimuli. And then on the left and right, you have passive self-regulation and active self-regulation, which is how you take the sensory information and how you self-regulate yourself depending on your body and the sense. And so on the top left, we have low registration, which is where you don't recognize or process all of the incoming sensory information. On the top right, we have sensation seeking, where you an individual will chase novel, complex, and intense sensations. They love to experience the sensation for its own sake, and they may take risks to pursue those experiences. On the bottom left, you have sensory sensitive, 
which is an increased awareness compared to other people of information gained from the senses. And then you have sensation avoiding, which is when an individual feels overwhelmed by sensory information and will actively avoid the stimulation. Okay, so now we're looking at symptoms and these are specifically symptoms for sensory processing. And so under behavior symptoms, we have excessively high or excessively low activity levels. You have blinking, squinting, or rubbing your eyes frequently, and even resisting certain grooming activities. Physical symptoms include impaired coordination, bumping into things, and then being overly sensitive to or incapable of sensing touch. Cognitive symptoms include speech and language delays, poor attention span, and being easily so overstimulated in a group setting. Psychosocial symptoms include an onset of anxiety, depression, and difficulty developing a sense of independence. And again, all these symptoms very much vary from person to person. There are not two individuals that will have the exact same symptoms or reactions to the same senses. Okay, so now kind of seeing how sensory processing and autism spectrum disorder are correlated. Up to 90% of people with an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis also have sensory processing difficulties. Both conditions can involve heightened sensitivity to sensory stimuli, difficulty distinguishing between different sensory inputs, and then also having sensory seeking behaviors. The DSM-5 includes hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input as one of the behaviors associated with autism spectrum disorder. And while children with autism may experience sensory overload in relation to the five core senses, which are taste, touch, hearing, sight, and smell, they may also react to the proprioceptive and vestibular senses that we discussed earlier. And to kind of just define play as an occupation, this is taken from the OTPF um, so that we're all on the same page. Play is activities that are intrinsically motivated, internally controlled, and freely chosen that maybe include a suspension of reality such as fantasy. You have exploration, humor, risk-taking, contests, and celebrations. And it is a complex and multidimensional phenomenon that is shaped by sociocultural factors. So play will be very different where I'm from compared to where someone else is from. And then play is further defined into play exploration and play participation. Play exploration is identifying play activities, including exploration play, practice play, pretend play, games with rules, and constructive play. Whereas participation play is maintaining a balance of play with other occupations, obtaining, using, and maintaining toys, equipment, and supplies. Okay, some assessments that we have. These are assessments that I'm familiar with, that I have used, or I have seen my clinical instructors use. Um, that is the Sensory Profile 2, which is a norm reference assessment used to identify sensory processing patterns, and it comprehends the impact of different sensory processing patterns on functional performance. The price is $339 for the complete kit, but it's able to be used on from ages birth to 14 years and 11 months, and it is given to caregivers and teachers to fill out. This ass assessment is accessible through Pearson Publishing. And then there's also the sensory processing measure, the second edition, which it items provides descriptive clinical information on processing vulnerabilities within each sensory system, including under and over reactivity, sensory seeking behavior and difficulties with perception. This has a wider, wider range of use. You can use it from four months to 87 years and it has a starting price of $330. And you can able to access this assessment through WPS Publishing. And so I'd love to take the time now. These are the only two assessments that I'm familiar with for sensory processing. But if you use a different assessment um, in your country or maybe an assessment that is more accessible or cheaper, 
uh, if you could please put that down in the chat so I could learn from you and maybe we can all learn about different assessments that we are able to access. Um, just because we have these two great ones um, and there's also parent and caregiver interviews and observations, but I'd love to learn about what other assessments there are out there. Okay, so we'll now go into sensory behaviors. For oral seekers, and then, so for each sensory behavior, there's a seeker and an avoider. And so we'll kind of break down each one. Oral seekers, you tend to see an individual who will chew or suck on non-food items. They are constantly placing items into their mouth and they're sucking their thumb or biting their fingernails. If they're oral avoiders, they tend to gag a lot. They refuse to eat. You have a lot of picky eaters and they tend to have speech or feeding delays. For vestibular seekers, they are constantly in motion, they're running, they're jumping, and they're spinning around. They're climbing up and down furniture and they enjoy being upside down. Vestibular avoiders are the opposite. They prefer sedentary activities. They enjoy sitting down. They avoid swings and slides in the playground. They will feel unsteady on slanted floors and they are fearful of tilting backwards or whenever their feet are not touching the ground. Tactile seekers are constantly touching or fiddling with their clothes, surfaces, or other objects. They crave hugs, kisses, and prolonged contact, and they prefer messy play and activities, and they tend to engage in rough play. For tactile avoiders, they will avoid toys, clothing, or food with specific textures. They dislike when their hair or skin is being wet and will therefore avoid swimming or bathing, having a huge impact on occupations. They'll avoid play with other children in fear of being touched, and they will refuse to wear tight or scratchy clothes. For proprioceptive seekers, they have poor judgment and grading of their movements. They frequently bump into things or they will fall, generally poor body awareness, and they will also engage in rough play. If you're a proprioceptive avoider, you're cautious and play with others. You avoid active activities, um, unable to properly assess the risk in their physical environment, so they tend to take a step back and do more sedentary activities and they tend to be extremely sensitive to touch. For visual seekers, they will seek out bright and busy environments. They prefer toys with bright, reflective, or shiny surfaces, often distracted by objects that spin or flash, and they insist on clothing and toys with specific shapes, colors, and patterns, and crave that screen time from their iPad or a TV. Visual avoiders will frequently cover their eyes or hide their heads under their pillows. They react strongly or as if in pain to bright strobing or fluorescent light, and they perceive dim, normal, or natural light as much brighter than it actually is. And then we have auditory seekers. They will make repetitive sounds such as clapping, tapping, or clicking. They have difficulty focusing on a task without humming or making noise. They prefer to have constant background noise, such as music from or TV or a fan. And they insist on listening to TV or music at a volume that may be uncomfortable to others. If you're an auditory avoider, you when you're faced with sound, you might typically cover your own ears. You're distressed by sudden noises like alarms or phone ringings. You struggle in large and populated spaces, will avoid everyday sounds, and you make, may make sounds yourself to cover the environmental noise. And so those cover all the senses. Um, a lot of these sensations you may identify or you thought of someone that identifies with it. I am an auditory seeker. And so I think kind of considering where you lie with all these senses can be very beneficial for when you create interventions for your clients to kind of get a better understanding of how and what your preferences are. And so what can we do with these sensory behaviors? And that is sensory regulation. And so sensory regulation is the ability to change arousal to match the environment and the activity. Essentially, it's an ability to adjust to an optimal level of arousal 
and it allows children to maintain an appropriate level of alertness in order to respond appropriately across environments to the sensory stimuli present. Okay, so how can sensory regulation strategies impact play? It can impact their attention can, into both poor, fair, or good attention, and will then cause sustained effort, doing activities without distraction, and being able to hold effort long enough to complete a task or an occupation. It can impact self-regulation, the ability to obtain, maintain, and change one's emotion, behavior, attention, and activity level appropriate for a task or situation in a socially acceptable manner. And then you can also have increased tantrums, emotional reactivity, a need for control, impulsive behaviors, become easily frustrated or overly compliant when self-regulation is impacted. And then it can also impact arousal level, which is the function of alertness, situational awareness, vigilance, and level of distraction. They will have a show a heightened reactivity to sound, touch, or movement. They may also be underreactive to certain situations, for example, not noticing their name being called whenever they're touched, if they have toothpaste on their face, or they may even have a very high pain threshold. They can also appear lethargic or disinterested, often appearing to be mostly in their own world. Okay, so now we'll go through some regulation strategies for all the senses. And so if you are an oral seeker providing kind of crunchy snacks, lollipops, chewies, or Z-vibes for your child can really provide that regulation. If they're oral avoiding, applying deep pressure outside of the mouth, um, and also just providing predictability to reduce anxiety. If you're doing some sort of activity that involves the oral cavity, kind of notifying them, talking them through it so that there are no surprises. If they are a vestibular seeker, having sensory activities that are goal-directed, but also activities that have a clear start and stop. And so something I would often do is I would have my, my client kind of go on the swing for a couple of minutes before the session to provide some sensory regulation, but letting them know that we'll have to stop um, and transition to another activity. So that's the entire intervention is not just swinging. Um, if they're vestibular avoiding, using a footstool under their feet, so their feet are constantly touching the ground, providing a quiet place to lie down um, after motion sickness or headaches, and then not lifting, tilting, or moving the child without giving them a warning. Tactile seekers, you want to give them some fidget spinners, a stress ball, stretchy bands, providing a variety of textures in toys, clothing, and food, having sensory tables in your classrooms, or even having a crash pad so they're still able to participate, but in a safe manner. If they're a tactile avoider, providing firm or deep pressure input through a weighted blanket or vest, which I will go into more in the home program. Um, providing them control in their choices of what they want to do, doing sensory play through a plastic bag. Um, this is something I've done. I've hidden like Lego pieces um, into like foam or paint and put that all inside a plastic bag so they can still play and participate, uh, but not necessarily touching the actual messiness. And then participating in heavy work. And then just a quick definition for heavy work, it's um, activities that involve pushing, pulling, or carrying heavy objects. And this provides input to your proprioceptive system, which generally helps kind of calm the nervous system. And so heavy work is very huge um, for really calming down any of the sensory behaviors. And then we have proprioceptive um, Sorry, we have proprioceptive seekers and having them also participate in heavy muscle work activities can be beneficial, deep pressure activities, going on the trampoline and then chewing bubble gum. So kind of any activity that involves the whole body. If they're proprioceptive avoiding, rolling or pushing a ball can be a nice sedentary way to still participate and play. Uh, providing verbal cues about the environment, again, reducing anxiety 
um, yoga stretches, and then playing games that increase body awareness, like Simon says. Okay, and then we have visual seekers. You want to play with lights and visually stimulating toys. You want to have a healthy amount of screen time using visual aids, such as a visual schedule, and then participating in visual scanning or tracking activities. If they are visually visual avoiders, you want to be aware of the colors and patterns of the toys you're using, the decor of the room, and the clothes you may be wearing. Always kind of try to go for some dim lighting so you don't irritate their eyes. And just be mindful of clutter, reflective surfaces, and lights from electronics or appliances. And then auditory seekers, you want to use noise-making toys, schedule time within the day to sing, clap, and listen to music, and then using songs to enhance learning new skills, such as cleaning and brushing your teeth. And then the big one I found for um, auditory avoiders is just kind of providing headphones. They have some control to like cancel out the noise um, and just take a minute to kind of self-regulate. All right, and so then we'll go into the home program. Uh, this is a program that I would provide my clients um, or their families. Um, as we know, we only see these kids maybe one to two times a week. And so it's very valuable that these programs and these goals are still um, hit directed at home and so that they're able to get the most of it and achieve their goals. And so kind of providing that education towards families is very valuable. Um, having a weighted lap bag or a backpack is very recommended. It is important to note that it shouldn't be no more than 10% of the child's body weight. And although there is no research to support this, there has been um, clinical observations of the improved regulation provided by this weighted vest and backpack. I have used it where a child can use it throughout the session and it kind of provides heavy work. So again, that proprioceptive input or even having the child wear it in the morning before intervention um, just for a bit to kind of provide that input. Having the child have gum or crunchy foods into their daily routine, drinking thick liquids through a thick straw like milkshakes, smoothies, yogurts, and applesauce, participating in pillow fights, sitting in bing bag chairs and pouring items such as sand, dry beans, dry rice, or water back and forth between containers. And then the larger containers you have, the more heavy work you will be doing. And so a lot of these kind of just depend on the child's sensory preferences, um, but kind of just using the sensory regulation strategies that I provided earlier, kind of creating your own home program that really targets the sensory behaviors that the child is eliciting. And so, yeah, we then go into the case study. And so that is really my presentation. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat um, and I'd be happy to answer it. If there are no questions, you can go ahead and go into the case study. But this case study is based off a child that I had um, at my outpatient pediatric clinic. Patient C is a four-year-old girl with an autism diagnosis who is enrolled in school and has a behavioral therapist do a home visit three times a week. Her and her mother have come to an outpatient clinic for an initial evaluation with concerns of symptoms that are impacting her daily routine, specifically in attention, self-regulation, and arousal levels. When the therapist went to meet C and her mother, C was asleep in her mother's arms and wanted to be carried to the evaluation room. While collecting past medical history and goals, the therapist notes that, the, that she is primarily nonverbal, but often scripts utterances and the ABCs. She is observed to scratch herself and her environment while participating in various activities. However, she appears to enjoy the swing and the trampoline the most, but attempted to escape multiple times when asked to sit, to draw, eat, etc. When the mother asked about her goals, she states that she would like C to become more independent in self-care and increase attention in seated activities. And so with that being said, I have all the discussion questions that will kind of look at what questions should be asked in the initial evaluation, 
assessments and sensory behaviors present. Um, every group was, I hope that every group was able to have uh, great discussions. So we'll go ahead and get started with the first question, which is, what are some questions that should be asked in this initial evaluation? Maggie, did your group have anything to share? Um, yeah, we were um, talking a little bit about sleep routine and kind of just overall arousal, maybe like even understanding what time of day the evaluation was taking place. Um, we also talked about what specific type of self-care is the family kind of looking for to then kind of cater different um, treatment interventions, and then as well as diet um, to be kind of aware of the family dynamic and also know what kind of um, food the fam family kind of caters to. Great, thank you. Lindsay, did your group have anything different to add? Yeah, we talked about a few of the things that Maggie mentioned, and we also said that we would want to just learn more about the family's daily routine um, and the things that C is participating in at home um, and then what her general interests are and how she currently likes to play um, and if there had, has been anything that the mom has noticed that um, C is really avoiding um, or if there's anything that like really gets her going specifically um, just learning more about what those are. Thank you. And we'll go on to the second question, which is what assessments should be done in this evaluation? Kelsey, did your group have anything? I didn't have a group today. <laughs> okay, Adonis. Well, we would suggest uh, the sensory profile to child uh, form and uh, sensory integration clinical observations. Thank you. And then Alex. We also talked about the sensory profile too, and then observational um, and um, report by the mother. Yeah, our group also mentioned sensory assessments, um, doing a parent questionnaire about the goals they would like or any behavior seen at home, and then a self-care and fine motor skills assessment to also be done. All right, and then the third question was describe any sensory behaviors present and what strategies can be done to target self-regulation. Maggie. Um, we talked about um, like the scratching and kind of needing to be on the trampoline and the swing and um, not really kind of refusing any sort of seated activities. So we talked about um, can maybe putting the child on the swing and kind of creating some more linear or organized movements while slowly integrating some um, activities, maybe that's, um, you know, drawing or kind of pausing the swing and doing some activity real quick and then going back to the swing to kind of create that buy in a little bit more. Great, thank you. Lindsay. Yeah, we had similar thoughts. Um, we noticed that she was vestibular seeking. And so um, people mentioned like starting a session with the swing and trampoline um, and even starting to like work on her attention um, with activities like while she's on a swing or something like that before progressing to like doing seated activities and things like that. Um, and then we also talked about how she's tactile seeking. Um, and so providing fidgets and stress balls and the stretchy bands and the things that you had mentioned um, throughout the session um, just to help her with her tactile behaviors as well. That's great. Yeah, one of the strategies that I used with this patient um, was providing her with like a foam board that she could scratch herself um, as opposed to scratching her own body, kind of using that to like target something else, but it's a little bit safer, but still providing sensory regulation. Okay, we'll go to the fourth question, which are what are some example goals you would target in a future session, Adonis? Well, we suggest giving opportunities uh, for C to participate in simulatory activities for regulation, uh, to be able to increase level of participation following calming strategies implemented. Thank you. And then Alex? Um, we also talked about similar goals um, about increasing participation in self-care activities, um, kind of 
um, with and without her mom. Um, and then also we talked about um, kind of increasing attention and being able to um, uh, do seated activities for a bit longer and slowly increasing that goal, um, starting really small and then increasing it to maybe a, a bit longer where she's able to do a self-care activity or something like that. Thank you. And then the final question, which was, what would you suggest to the patient's family for a home carryover? Maggie? Um, our group kind of talked about incorporating more social interactions, whether that's with other family members or peers, um, the child's age in the community, um, and even incorporating some arousal strategies for eating um, before mealtimes with the family. Right. Lindsay, your group. Yeah, we had some similar things. Um, we talked about like if um, using the swing or the trampoline at the beginning of a session um, works really well for her attention. Um, an outpatient then talking about like move transferring that home, um, providing her with like an opportunity for the trampoline or just like a movement break right before they sit down for a meal um, to hopefully help with her attention. Um, and then also um, using like a, a therapy ball or a beanbag chair um, and giving her that option um, and also um, incorporating rough surfaces at home or um, using like sensory bins and playing in rice or sand or something like that um, and then just noticing all the things that are helping her with attention in um, sessions and then just always relaying that back to the parents. Thank you. Adonis, did your group have anything different? Well, we had a controversial uh, suggestion upon that. On the SI um, uh, side, we would uh, engage in simulatory activities uh, like jumping on a trampoline or in, uh, bouncing on a uh, gym ball before doing some uh, self-care activities. But on the behavioral side, we would uh, uh, propose uh, bouncing as a reward activity for doing self-care uh, activities or school homework. Mm. That just depends on the situation in the case. Exactly. That's good. Alex, is your group? We also talked about kind of incorporating some sort of schedule of um, vestibular activity, movement break in between or before or after, depending on the purpose of um, like before eating or a self-care activity. We talked a lot about a about sensory activities, um, like um, someone talked about racetracks and climbing or bean bags or using um, sand. Um, and then someone also suggested something like a body sock for that like tactile, um, tactile sensation. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. And everyone, um for their participation, both in the breakout rooms, as well as in the last six weeks. Um, I appreciate all of you for participating in the study, as well as filling out the surveys. Um, but that's it for today. Great. Thank you, everyone.